Welcome to today's webinar, Grub Control, brought to you by Landscape Management and our sponsor, Arena Insecticide. I'm Diane Safranik from North Coast Media, publisher of Landscape Landscape Management Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available two weeks from today on our website, landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice in the lower left-hand corner of your console that there is a Submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of Landscape Management Magazine or in one of our weekly e-newsletters, LM Direct. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue and assistant producer Rick Aldrich or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Landscape Management Editor-in-Chief, Marisa Palmieri. Thank you, Diane, and welcome everyone to our third of three Build Your Business webinars. Today's topic is scrub control, and we have two great speakers lined up to cover both the technical and business sides of this service area. Also, um, well, maybe I should first introduce the speaker, sorry. We have Dave Shetler, the bug doc from Ohio State, and following him we'll have Andy Kurth, president of Weedman of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and we also have to thank our sponsor, Valent Professional Products, and its Arena Insecticide for making today's webinar possible. We have Todd Mayhew, a regional field development manager from Valent on the line to say a few words. Todd? Thank you, Marissa. Uh, Valent, on behalf of uh, Valent Professional Products, uh, makers of Arena, I uh, uh, appreciate your time and, um, and attention and uh, especially the speakers making time to, uh, to talk about um, these subjects and we're, um, we're looking forward to uh, participating in any, or helping you in any way possible. And um, if you have any uh, questions, you can visit our, our website at uh, uh, valentpro.com after the webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Todd. Up first is our technical speaker, Dave, um, the bug doc Shetler, as I already said. He's professor of urban entomology at The Ohio State University, where he performs outreach on turf and ornamental entomology, teaches general entomology, and concentrates on turf grass entomology research. We'll have a few minutes for Q&A with Dave on the technical side immediately after he speaks, so please feel free to use the Q&A box on your console to ask us questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Thank you, Marissa and Diane, and, and uh, again, Todd, uh, appreciate the, the sponsorship. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and get with it. Uh, the uh, talk, is, as you can see, that I've got here is both preventive and curative uh, grip control. And, and what I wanted to, to point out, uh, as an entomologist, uh, we use several what we call approaches. Uh, and as you can see, the preventive and curative are sort of at the, at the heart of what we do in, in terms of uh, managing uh, all types of pests, including white grubs. But I also wanted to point out, we do commonly preach tolerance. Uh, you know, I, I give permission to uh, most of my lawn care folks that, you know, you don't have to always do something. Uh, uh, doing nothing sometimes is, is also okay. But obviously, uh, uh, when it comes to white grubs, uh, there's a certain level of white grubs that uh, obviously you're not going to be able to tolerate. And uh, again, I have to kind of chuckle when I see some of my fellow entomologists talking about economic thresholds for grubs. And they keep talking about, well, you need uh, 8 to 10 grubs per square foot before you really need to do any treatment. And I keep pointing out, well, you haven't told the skunks and raccoons that uh, because they'll commonly eat uh, grubs or, or forage for grubs. Uh, in many cases, uh, when there may be only uh, uh, three to five grubs per square foot. So uh, we have to, to watch out for that. 
I also have what I call a rescue treatment, and, and this is to separate true curative treatments. As an entomologist, to me, a curative treatment should be made when a grub is in the uh, uh, first or second instar, uh, and if uh, you wait until they're in the third instars and, and the skunks and raccoons are digging them, now you're really talking about a, a, a rescue treatment and, and need to be uh, uh, thinking about, uh, as I say, getting out the sledgehammer in order to nail them at that time. Well, the other thing that I want to point out is that depending on where you're at, uh, virtually everybody has a different uh, grub complex. And we were discussing before we went online here that a lot of people are reporting that they're not seeing many Japanese beetles. And we've seen that in Ohio, where I'm from. But on the other hand, what we've seen is the mass chafer population, which we capture by light traps at night, has been virtually off the scale. Uh, and so even though you don't see Japanese beetles and you don't really associate that with your grubs, uh, I'm predicting for much of Ohio that we very definitely could have a, a significant mass chafer population out there that could cause just as much damage as the Japanese beetles ever did. And in other parts of the region, uh, European chafers are, are good survivors. We're seeing oriental beetles and Asiatic garden beetles moving in. Uh, and also, if you're in what we consider to be the traditional transition zone, you might have to deal with the, the green June beetle. Uh, and even in Ohio, we're seeing green June beetle, which usually was only found in the Ohio River Valley area, uh, was recently found up in, in Toledo in the northern part of the state. So uh, whether it's global warming or anything else, uh, these grub populations are changing over time. Now, the next thing that I'd like to, to remind all of you is that we're dealing with an insect that has a complete life cycle. And the real target uh, for this is, is the first instar, uh, whether we're doing a preventive application in which we're installing, as I say, pesticide residue in the soil thatch interface so that when the egg hatches out and that little first instar larva reaches the surface and takes its first bite of food, that food should have the insecticide in it and take it out. Uh, on the other hand, if we wait until we're in the third instars, as you can see from the, this image, the third instar grubs can be 30 to 50 times the body weight of that first instar uh, white grub. And so in that particular case, you're really going to need not only a lot more insecticide, but you're probably going to need a, a much more active kind of an insecticide to take those bigger grubs out. Now, uh, the next uh, slide that I've got here is, is to remind me uh, uh, a lot of my lawn care friends and, and uh, sport turf uh, manager friends and so forth, uh, I find it interesting in our spring conferences, they always say, uh, hey, bug doc, it, it was a very mild uh, winter. Uh, the grubs are going to be much worse this year, aren't they? And I, I have to chuckle, no. The only time that the grub populations can really increase is right now when they're laying eggs. And the real key to that is that virtually all of the white grubs, whether it's a Japanese beetle, whether it's a mass chafer, whether it's a May-June beetle, they all lay dehydrated eggs. And those eggs have to absorb moisture from the surrounding soil in order to develop. And you can see in this uh, particular image uh, a freshly laid egg, a little oval uh, thing, and then the egg that's been hydrated. So what that means is if we've got dry conditions like we had last uh, summer in, in much of the Northeast, uh, many of the grub eggs that were laid didn't survive. And the only place they survived well was probably in irrigated lawns or in places that, that the turf was kept green during that uh, period of time of overposition. Now, what I'd like to do is, is uh, we realize I've covered that uh, these white grubs have this complete life cycle. We realize that the key uh, to the population increases is typically in that uh, late June through July uh, egg laying period. But if we overlay their life cycle over an entire year, most of the grubs that we're most concerned about are ones that we call annual white grubs. Uh, and that means that they take one year to complete their life cycle. If we overlay on top of that uh, the residual activity period of our insecticides, we can sort of visualize when it would be appropriate to make certain insecticide applications. And in this one, uh, if we take a look at this, I've, I've got it labeled larval prevention. Uh, and what we're saying is that uh, notice that over much of this, in May and June, there aren't any larvae in the soil. Uh, there are pupae there. There are adults in there. But what we're doing is we're applying an insecticide that has enough residual activity 
that when those little first instar grubs do arrive at the end of July, there's enough effective residual to take them out. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, those, the effective residual of a lot of these insecticides uh, here in a minute. On the other hand, when you hear entomologists talking about a curative treatment, what we're talking about now is that indeed the larvae are there, the larvae uh, and, and virtually all of the eggs that, that have been uh, laid have hatched out, and typically we're talking about the smaller larvae. They're, we would hope that they're mainly first and second instar larvae, which are easier to kill. Uh, and, and if we wait till the end of September, now we're dealing with those third instar larvae, and that would be the period of time that we'd be talking about those rescue treatments. Now, uh, I'm going to go through what I call the insecticide tools. We have many tools uh, that, that we use to manage uh, white grubs, and, and I've broken these down. Uh, and frankly, there's a lot of these tools that you as a lawn care person can select from, uh, and there will be many factors that you have to consider. Obviously, uh, the, the number one thing that I hear from most professionals is how much is this going to cost me? Well, on the other hand, you also have to remember cost is not the only thing. In other words, the, the cost of the material, but what is its efficacy? And when I say efficacy uh, in the lawn care area, we're really dealing with how many callbacks am I going to get? Uh, because if, if you've got a, an insecticide, let's say, that, that's 85% uh, effective, that means that maybe 15% of the lawns that you treated, uh, you're, you're not going to uh, control them adequately and you might get a callback, and you compare that to something else that, that may be 95%, so you only get 15% callback versus 5% callback. And remember, those callbacks is where you really begin to lose your, your profit uh, with that. So with that said, let's take a look at these tools. And, and the first ones that I'm going to list here are the Neonix. Uh, the Neonix, uh, if you've been paying any attention to the media, have, have just been lambasted one way and the, the other. Uh, there are some environmentalists out there that, that say, oh, this is our chance to ban the, this whole category of pesticides. Uh, and unfortunately, they picked the honeybees um, and the poor pollinators as, as being the whipping boy for this. I kind of, again, as an entomologist, I have to raise my eyebrow, and I'm going, well, how much of the turf? And, and, you know, you're in the lawn care. I deal with sport turf managers. I deal with golf course managers. Typically, managed turf doesn't have flowering plants in it. Uh, if you've got flowering plants in it, which the honeybees would, would be visiting, uh, you're probably not doing a very good uh, uh, job of weed control. So in most managed turf where you've got decent weed control, to me, the use of the neonics is, is a non-question. It, it should not be one that, that you have to worry about. Now, if we take a look at the neonics, uh, remember that imiclopred or merit was the first one on the block, uh, and that, those were followed uh, pretty quickly by thymothoxum or meridian and clothianidin or arena. The latest one that we've uh, received on the market uh, is, is dinotefuron, which in, uh, uh, in other markets is, is called safari, but that's been brought to us with TBI Gordon. Obviously, virtually all of these are going off patent. Imidacloprid was the first one to go off patent, and, and because of that, uh, there are uh, some fairly inexpensive uh, uh, imidacloprid products out there. Uh, I'm going to show you the efficacy data of these, and, and in my book, uh, Basically, all the first three, imidacloprid, thymothoxin, clothianidin, are all showing at least 90% control or better when applied at the normal time that we would expect as, as a preventive or even early curative application. I'd like to also point out that there are still some other insecticide uh, uh, materials out there. The newest kit on the block is a celebrin. Uh, chloranthinylopol. This was originally brought to us by DuPont, but they've uh, sold this chemistry to Syngenta. Uh, and about this time of the year, I'm, I'm beginning to see some of the acelerant products with the Syngenta name on it. Uh, this one is, has been kind of a, a really unusual product as far as I'm concerned, and that we've even been making applications all the way into April, uh, the first and second week of April, and the residual efficacy of that particular molecule stays in there through August. But if you've been pricing out a celebrin or chloranthinylopol, you'll, you'll know that it's a pretty pricey material. And if you face that one with the cost of the neonics, uh, 
uh, again, the neonics uh, are, are obviously a less expensive choice. Also still on the market, I don't want to spend too much time on them, we still have halophenazide, uh, the insect growth regulator that uh, was brought out in, in the 90s by Dow. Carboreal, rather surprisingly, has made it through quite a few of the, the EPA uh, reviews, and, and so seven is still available, uh, and there are some generics of, of that one. And the last one that, that I'd like to talk about on, on this uh, non-neonic list uh, is Dilox, or trichlorophon. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit more about this one because in the industry, Dilox has generally been considered uh, as being the primary product that we use as a curative or a rescue. And I want to point out that we do have some other options uh, to the Dilox. Also, uh, want to point out that I think in the future, uh, what I'm seeing is there may not be all that many more new insecticides coming to market. But what I am seeing is that many of the companies are producing what we call combination products. And the reason for this, what we found is that, uh, that to give you an example, clothianidin by itself uh, was excellent on things like bill bugs and, and uh, uh, chinch bugs and, and white grubs, but it missed some of the, the turf infesting caterpillars and things like that. So they stuck bifenthrin in it, and you end up with a product like a loft. Uh, I'm also seeing the, the Andersons, uh, they're, they're keyed on uh, picking up some generic materials, and so they combine carboreal and bifenthrin. That would be Seven and, and Tallstar. Uh, again, it's, it's a very good curative insecticide, but uh, the active ingredients, carboreal and bifenthrin, have no residuals, and so it can't be used in a, a uh, preventive mode. Uh, also notice that uh, Syngenta has sold off the rights of their thiamethoxam and land uh, and that's come in, into the market as the duocide, uh, maxide uh, dual action uh, uh, material uh, with, with uh, uh, that particular company. Well, the next thing, oh my goodness, uh, if you take a look at this particular slide, you're going, I can't read that, everything's too small. What I, I'm going to give you a address at the end of my talk here uh, where you can actually download this uh, particular efficacy page. But what I've done for our particular talk is I'd like to break these things down. And so what I've done is where I've got a fair amount of literature that's been either produced uh, in the literature or we've uh, uh, produced in, in our own testing uh, sites, uh, these are the efficacy data for the, the most common grub insecticides by different months. And so this one is for May. And if we look at this, if you take a look at clothianidin, uh, May applications of clothianidin are yielding easily in that plus 90% control. A celebrant, same thing. We're seeing that. Now, on the other hand, if we take a look at Mach 2, Merit, and Meridian, Notice that those things are significantly reduced. We would expect maybe 90% control of those, but now we're getting, uh, in some cases, less than 80% control with those particular applications. What does this tell us? Well, all this really tells me as an entomologist is that the effective residuals of these insecticides, if applied in the month of May, may run out of steam. In other words, the, the uh, active residuals may run out of, of sufficient amount to kill the grubs that are arriving in July and August. And so uh, all I'm saying is that we've got a couple of choices here, I think, where you can make uh, May applications, but some other choices which may not be as good in that May window. Now if we move a month up, if we go into the month of June, what we see now is again uh, with the clothianidin products, the, the uh, sulfur products, uh, the Mach 2 products, the Merit products, the Meridian products, now when we're applying it in that window, virtually all of these are achieving that 90% that control. Uh, and, and so in that particular case, uh, I think June is obviously, for most of our annual white grubs, an ideal month for uh, putting them down as a preventive. How about July? Well, if we look at July, again, this would be the time when the grubs are still continuing to lay eggs and we've got first instars. Now you can see that, that we really maximize the, the efficacy of virtually all of these insecticides. And, and you can see some of these are getting pretty close to, to uh, you know, 100% control. And I think, again, as a, a lawn care uh, uh, person, you would want to think about 
this is the time that would, if I've got neighborhoods that I really know have major growth problems with them, boy, this would be the ideal time for me to make that application so that I get virtually zero callbacks uh, from that application. Well, let's move on in to another time. Now, notice that this is kind of an odd one. It, it says that this is August 1st to August 16th, and, and I've had people say, well, why did you break it apart that way? Why isn't it the whole month of August? Well, you have to go back to that grub life cycle, and, and basically what I'm stating, this is the time that most of these grubs are in the first and maybe early second instar stage. And if we start looking at these, now unfortunately we've got fewer data in this, but uh, as you'll see in the, the clothianid and our arena, it's still performing adequately, but there's only two studies there. If we look at the Celeprin, uh, DuPont didn't even want it tested at, at that time. They said, we don't think there's any curative action uh, for a Celeprin, but we now have some data that we think uh, that, that it would probably work in this uh, early August window. On the other hand, if we take a look at, at the halofenazide, the imidacloprid, and the thiamatoxin, all of those are still running uh, probably in the, the very acceptable range. Now, let's take a look at, at the end of this. Uh, what about uh, mid-August to early September? Now we're definitely in the second instar white grubs. Uh, we're also possibly beginning to see some, some early third instar uh, white grubs. And so this would be what I would call an, an early curative treatment. And in this particular one, we do have a, a bit more data on, on the arena. And as you can see, it's performing quite well. Uh, we have one study with the acelebrin at a higher rate, and, and actually it did quite well. What is falling down, however, the Mach 2 is, is significantly decreasing as the grubs get larger. But take a look at the, the imidacloprid and thiamatoxin. We've got large databases for those. And, and again, what I ask a lot of my uh, lawn care friends, uh, what do you use for that curative treatment in, in uh, late August and September? And they often say Dilox. And uh, if you look at the numbers, why would you, uh, you know, apply a treatment that's really pretty expensive to get maybe 80% control when you could apply something like uh, thiamethoxam or imidacloprid for considerably less and get better control? So again, I'll just leave that with you, that, that sort of question there that I, as an entomologist, uh, with, with the data that I've got uh, in hand, uh, what I find is, is that uh, many of these neonicotinoids that we usually have said work better as a preventive are actually doing quite well uh, as early curatives. Now, with that said, uh, I don't have the data in front of here, but we've now performed uh, several rescue treatments with clothianidin or arena. Uh, and, and what we found that even in late September, uh, we're getting virtually the same control level that we do with the Dilox. And, and again, I mention that because some people are looking for alternatives for Dilox. Dilox is, again, an organophosphate insecticide. Clothianidin being a neonicotinoid is a different chemical category. Uh, and actually, if you take a look at the tox package of those uh, two insecticides, I think you'd uh, see that, that clothianidin would be the, the less toxic material to use as a uh, curative or a rescue treatment. Well, I see that, that my time's about to run out here, so let me uh, run through uh, the, these last slides. And, and one of the things I did want to uh, touch on is uh, why is it that you are doing what I call rescue treatments? And, and what we find, if you take a look at this turf, you'll notice the turf itself, especially over there on the, the right-hand side, looks pretty good but it's been rototilled by raccoons. Uh, and so what that means is that there were enough grubs to attract the raccoons uh, in that particular area, uh, but in actuality, the turf was uh, doing pretty good. And, and so in this particular case, uh, the rescue treatment was to avoid the animals. And, and one of the things that we are recommending uh, in our uh, uh, different types of uh, treatments is that if you do get into that rescue treatment, we found that spreading an organic fertilizer such as milorganite often will chase the animals away for about seven to 10 days. And again, if you're using something like uh, uh, clothianidin or arena, or you're using Dilox, uh, you'll probably need that about three to five days for those insecticides to kick in uh, and uh, make the grubs uh, basically unsuitable uh, to be eaten by the skunks and raccoons. And so uh, if you are into rescue treatments, that's just sort of one of those little hints that I would give you 
uh, as, as uh, something to consider. Now, again, I have a lot of people. Uh, obviously, there's a big emphasis in, in the environment and, and uh, people asking, are there alternatives? Unfortunately, as an entomologist, there are a lot of websites that have what I consider to be rather dubious information on them. Uh, and there, you, even if you go to the garden centers, you'll still see milky disease on the, the shelves and so forth. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, what I've seen, and, and we've got a pretty large body of information that's showing that milky disease, number one, is a, a very poor controlled material. Even at its best, it was only giving about a 25% infection rate. So if you had 50 grubs per square foot, even if you kill 25% of them with milky disease, uh, that's not going to be enough to save the turf. The other thing, the commercial strains of milky disease only work on Japanese beetles. So if you've got mass chafers, if you've got oriental beetles, Asiatic garden beetles, uh, that particular strain wouldn't uh, work on them. Also on the internet are things like Metarizium and Bavaria. These are fungi, and there are formulations that can be purchased. Uh, again, these are weak pathogens. They usually don't kill any more than about 15 to 20 percent of the population, even in the best of conditions. The one biocontrol that we do have that will work once in a while, if, if you get fresh material uh, and you apply them immediately uh, upon uh, re, uh, receiving them, uh, you can get control, but in general, when you compare those with the insecticides, they're quite expensive to use, and, and even with the best of, of applications, uh, turn out to be somewhat inconsistent. Well, I, as I see uh, here, my, my team's uh, pretty well uh, about to run out. And as I promised earlier, uh, here is, is my home web page. Uh, the way that you get to this home web page is, is through the bugs.osu.edu uh, portal. That will take you to our general entomology uh, extension website. You click on my name. Uh, this particular page will, will show up. If you take a look over on the right-hand side, you'll see the second red box there where it says turf insecticide evaluations. I have posted on that particular page those grub efficacy data that I presented to you today. I also have efficacy data on the bill bugs and chinch bugs, uh, which you might uh, also be pleased to find out that many of the, especially the neonicotinoids that I talked about, have cross activity for both bill bugs and chinch bugs. And so, you can make a single application, primarily for the white grubs, but uh, get, uh, again, uh, control of, of uh, multiple pests. Well, uh, Marissa and, and uh, Diane, I think that's, that's all I, ha I had to say. And, and uh, uh, just wanted to, to uh, turn this over, uh, back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Dave. That was all excellent information. Um, I just want to invite anyone out there to use their chat box to send questions um, through the Q&A box to us. We have a few moments for questions with Dave. Um, and then I have a couple. Um, we, we talked about how you, um, white grub populations aren't that bad in Ohio, but have you heard nationally, are there any other areas where they are bad this year? Well, actually, uh, I didn't mean to apply that they weren't bad. Uh, we, we've had very localized areas. And, and what I find in Ohio, uh, we've got some epicenters down basically in Cincinnati, uh, some of them in, in the uh, Columbus area, and, and even up in the Cincinnati and areas where they had major droughts last year. But probably the, the common theme with all of them uh, is that these are usually upscale neighborhoods that have irrigation systems. And, and so when you run the water, uh, obviously, the, the grub eggs survive better and you're, you're at higher risk. And uh, please understand, I, I'm not against irrigation systems. I'm not against having high quality turf grass uh, during the summertime. But as an entomologist, that does put you at higher risk. And so, for the lawn care folks, uh, if you've got some of those neighborhoods uh, that, that you've got customers that, that have those high quality lawns, they probably really ought to have a preventive treatment uh, of one of these grub insecticides in that area just to, to ensure that you don't get grubs. In the other neighborhoods, uh, the lawns are let uh, go and, and they go dormant, you're probably at lower risk of having grubs. OK, great. Um, we have a question about efficacy rates um, on heavy clay versus heavy sand soil. Do you have any research or experience on that? 
Yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, the way that most entomologists, we were having an entomology, uh, uh, grass entomology conference uh, coming up, and, and we've been debating this for some uh, time. And unfortunately, uh, many of the published reports don't put in the soil texture uh, in that. It's been my feeling that the underlying soil texture is probably irrelevant. What are, where these grubs are picking up their insecticide is actually in the lower layer of the thatch. And probably the biggest driving force is the amount of thatch that you've got in your turf. Uh, and I often state to, to people, if you've got more than a half an inch of thatch, you really need to do the thatch management before you can expect good grub control. OK, great. Um, we have a question about merit. How long does it take merit to be used as a curative treatment to kill the grubs? Uh, we've actually done, uh, as I stated before, we've done some side-by-side -side stu uh, studies with uh, both thiamethoxam or meridian, uh, clothianidin, and uh, arena, and imidacloprid or, or uh, merit. And the way that they rank is that uh, thiamethoxam, uh, apparent, or thiamethoxam and imidacloprid do kill the grubs as a curative or a rescue treatment, but it typically takes about 15 to 20 days to achieve probably in the 60 to 70 percent control. On the other hand, when we've used clothianidin products, we get uh, generally in that 70 to 80 percent control, which is the same as the Dilox uh, uh, treatments, in about three to five days. And again, that's about the same time period uh, as the, uh, 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 the Dilox. So it depends on how fast you need control. Uh, it's been our impression where we have made those fall uh, treatments no matter which neonic we use, the grubs don't reappear the next spring. So uh, all of these will kill them. It's just the speed of kill that is the question. OK. Um, how about what are the effects of the treatments in regard to subterranean mammals, such as voles and moles? This person <laughs> saying that in um, no, no, Southeast Virginia. Well, the, 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 uh, again, I go back. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there are websites and, and there are even, uh, what do we say, these over-the-counter products that, that go for sale. And I remember I about fell out of my chair when I heard uh, one of the, the national chains that sells over-the-counter materials with their spring treatment uh, uh, scenario. And they said, if you've got moles, it means you've got to have grubs. And I go, oh, my God. Uh, and, the, and the reason for that, remember, the number one food of moles are earthworms. And so if you've got moles, that means you probably have good soil and a good earthworm population. And, you know, EPA is kind of looking at these things and they're saying, we don't want to register an insecticide that kills earthworms. So we're, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. OK. Um, how about how long does bifenthrin last? Uh, bifenthrin, um, as a surface application that we've seen, and, and, uh, the, and what we typically use as, as the residual activity of this is either chinch bugs uh, or the sod webworm complex. And what we've typically seen is usually no more than about 14 days of effective residual from that molecule. OK, and we'll just take um, one more here. What would you do if you had high alkaline soil and grubs um, to defeat the high grub attack on the turf? Well, if I had high alkaline soils, I'm, I'm not overly worried about uh, most of the insecticides except for two, and that would, that would be Dilox or trichlorophon and surprisingly seven. So, uh, seven or carboreal seems to be pretty reactive uh, to, to high alkalinity. But again, remember where it is that you're applying this. Uh, the reality is, is that most decaying thatch is slightly on the acidic side. And since that's where we want the residue of our insecticide, that's not going to degrade. Uh, but again, it would be the, the tank mixture. Is, is that on the neutral or slightly acidic side? Uh, or uh, uh, is, is the thatch itself on the uh, slightly acidic side? Uh, and in most of the cases that I've seen data on that, that's what we're looking at. Uh, so the, the actual soil acidity or alkalinity is, is probably not a major factor. OK, great. Well, um, that'll wrap up the technical portion. And we're, um, thanks very much again to, to Dave for being here. We really appreciate it.
Now I'm going to introduce Andy Kurth. He's um, going to talk to us about the business standpoint of grub control for lawn care companies. He's president of Weedman of Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Fox Valley, Wisconsin, and Rockford, Illinois. He's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin with a degree in soil science with emphasis in turf management and agribusiness. And in 2012, Andy was voted one of the top 40 under 40 from In Business Magazine, and he's also president of Wisconsin Lawn Care Association, LAWN, and is a past lawn person of the year. So welcome, Andy. Turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be speaking, and thanks to Dave. Uh, as uh, I know it's cliche, but uh, he's forgotten more about this than, than I, than I care, either care to or will have ever known. Um, but it's, uh, it's great even coming on this uh, where I think I know a lot about grubs and stuff. You learn something every single time uh, you listen to uh, Dave and, and others, uh, colleagues as well. So thank you to Dave and thank you to Todd at Valent for, uh, for sponsoring as well. Um, well, I guess my presentation will be really short and sweet because I don't need to spend much time discussing um, the, uh, the behaviors and, and uh, the, the data and the science as much as it is maybe our, uh, the, the mechanism for how we go about uh, our business, if you will. So, um, so uh, again, don't need to spend a lot of time on this because uh, this has already been gone over. Well, the only thing I would maybe discuss differently uh, with whether it's Japanese beetles or the Schaefers, um, is that for me, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, so um, our timetable is, it seems to be slightly delayed um, compared to the Ohio's, um, uh, Southern Illinois, or middle of Illinois, Indiana, things like that. So uh, these life cycles are slightly dependent depending on where you're at um, and how they go. This year, for example, um, it was, you know, we had such a late spring. This is the latest year that we've, this is the latest that we've ever started um, uh, treating lawns in the springtime. Um, we had, uh, I think, three years ago, four years ago, whenever it was, we had uh, like a record snowfall year, like 20% more snow than we received in any other year. Um, and this year, we actually ended up starting later um, than even that year. So everything did get pushed back a little bit. But even then, the beetles started coming out uh, early July here. Well, I guess the, the reasons uh, to offer uh, grub control in general, um, the number one as a business side of things that can be very profitable, um, that's the ultimate, the ultimate goal, at least in a private business, is to, I shouldn't say that's for everybody's private uh, the goal, but it certainly is one of the major goals. Um, another thing is it can lead to other services. So we found it to be a very effective um, way to gain other, uh, to grow other portions of our business for spraying for insects, whether it's spraying for, we started out by spraying for Japanese beetles. Um, and now we've expanded that to um, spot spraying, uh, well not for, I shouldn't say spot spraying, but doing other applications, whether it's into trees, um, not just uh, ornamental beds, but for smaller trees. And um, as well as, as we've expanded our business into things like mosquitoes, um, things like that that, are, that customers seem to have a, uh, a uh, deep hatred for. <laughs> so certainly we've been able to capitalize on that and help. Um, and then the obvious one is customer service. Our opinion here at Weedman is that it's our job to be the experts. It's our job to be their lawn care consultant. Um, and it's really important that we're the ones trying to find their solutions, to find the solutions to their problems. Or, or again, being the lawn care consultant, notifying them, um, uh, Dave had a good thought, you know, on when we're saying uh, we can't, we can't, we, we'll never know always if somebody's going to have a major problem that year or not. So we try to we try to sell this as a preventative or a preventive, um, and uh, and notifying people that you should do this um, because it'll prevent some problems in the future if if you might have any. We've had circumstances where we've told somebody, well, you need, you really should do this, and then they say no, and then three months later they have a terrible grub problem and there's dead patches all over the lawn, and they say, well, you should have told me to do that. And we laugh. We're like, well, we told you. We notified you. So we'd, we'd rather be in a position where we're, where we're telling people too many things, and then we let them make the choice of what they actually want to do. Um, as for grub control in our business, we've been selling it since 2004. Um, it's a little different here because um, in the upper Midwest, the Japanese beetle, for example, has just swept across um, the upper Midwest. You know, in Madison, I, if I remember right, I want to say probably like 06 or 07, it really started coming hard. Um, and it was a big wave, and probably in, 
uh, maybe 08 or 09, sometime in that range, uh, we had probably the, the heaviest amount of visual Japanese beetles. So that became um, much easier uh, to sell. People can see the actual beetles and we can help them relate to that. Uh, but back in 04, we started out with 3% of our customer base, um, and now we do close to 20% of our customers. Um, and that is really in our markets. Overall, we don't have the highest pressure um, comparatively to Ohio's and um, southern Illinois and things like that where you have extremely, sometimes can have extremely high pressure from, from, uh, from white grubs. So um, again, going into the next thing here, the, the execution of selling this, uh, can vary greatly. Um, we do a number of different things that, that uh, play into that factor. The first one is uh, the service provider, the technician out on the lawn, the education they provide uh, and the notes they provide um, is really, really uh, important in our opinion because although I know not everybody reads that stuff, not all, the, not all the homeowners do, but again, they're paying us to be the expert. They're paying us to be their consultant. And if it's coming from somebody on their lawn saying, hey, you really should consider this. This has been a big problem in your neighborhood, and it could be a problem on your lawn um, this season or in the future. We recommend doing this. Uh, that helps. Email correspondence. Um, we actually send out um, some information, uh, informative uh, stuff on grubs, uh, whether it's their, uh, marketing pieces or uh, as a newsletter, um, but then also emailing back and forth, notifying customers of potential problems. Uh, sales team, we actually try to make outbound calls to every customer to notify them of the issue and try to make sure they at least know they should do something, whether we do it or whether they do it themselves. Um, that can be helpful as well. And then, like I mentioned above, uh, the market in general. The, you know, in Madison, the, the pressure in Madison could be different than the pressure in Cincinnati. Um, whether it's on the Mass Schaefer or Japanese Beetle, um, all that can completely change depending on where you're at. Uh, Green Bay, uh, Wisconsin, has been an area that we've never had any grubs, any Japanese beetles, until I believe last year or two or three years ago. Um, and then now, as of last year, um, they are a little bit heavier there now, and, we're, and people are um, starting to realize that's a problem. And it's now, we're just starting to see that up in the Minneapolis area. Uh, as well. So you can kind of see how at least the Japanese beetle kind of sweeps its way across certain areas and now it's starting to infect quite a bit of different uh, um, metropolitan areas. Um, we do about a quarter of a million dollars in grub control a year um, and uh, again that's kind of been a long process and we have uh, five, we're in five markets right now so that's not just in Madison, that's over our five markets. Uh, we have made the choice for our pricing to price this service with a very high margin. So again, there could be tools, there could be a couple different uh, schools of thought here. You could, you could reduce the margin substantially um, and try to ensure if you have a very high pressure area where you just want to ensure everybody gets something uh, or a higher percentage of your customers get it, you could lower the, the margin and, and try to make it really affordable or try to make it as affordable as possible. The problem with that uh, like David mentioned, in my opinion, is that if you have reapplications because people don't water it in, and let's be honest, not some a larger, probably the vast majority of people, even though we tell them it needs to be watered in, if it doesn't rain, they may never even water it in. So um, you're risking the reapp. So you have to make sure you, you at least consider that in your pricing structure. Um, I, in my opinion, you should always consider or look to price at four times whatever the, whatever you'd pay for that product cost, um, and in some cases. You, know, you could be upwards of 10 times. Uh, it, it depends on all, in my opinion, uh, again, what you prefer. I mean, it's, it's all basis on where you're at, what, what, what your outcome is you're trying to achieve. Um, are you okay with getting a certain less percentage of, of applications sold, but your margin is much higher so that way you're doing less applications and making as much or more money? Um, or is your goal to, again, provide it to as, vast, as many of your customers as possible to to, uh, to, to reduce the damage. In our area, uh, we, have, we, we definitely have uh, grub problems. We don't have them as widespread, like I mentioned earlier, in as areas in southern Illinois, things like that, where maybe you would consider a different strategy or the same. Uh, we had try to simplify things for our customers, and we, bas we not bas no, no pun intended, we basically offer uh, two things. We offer a basic or a preventive approach. Um, and we offer what we, what we call a deluxe. We're trying to simplify it for people who don't, you know, uh, nobody knows what a midicloprid is, um, or no homeowners do. No, nobody knows what arena is. So we try to say this is our basic uh, or preventive approach to grubs, 
and this, or if you have some other concerns, this is what we'd provide with the deluxe. So for the basic, we provide, uh, we use a midicloprid, um, and it, where we're at in the upper Midwest, we typically try to time that out uh, sometime between June and early August. It seems to be effective in that range. Um, you could put down probably even in May up here and be fine, but for us, and the way our program works, there's no real um, incentive for us to do that until June. Um, as for as for a what we call our deluxe, we use Arena. Um, so, uh, coincidentally, uh, Valent is is here and sponsoring this, but that is not but that's not why we use Arena. Arena is a great product, um, and that is something that we are able to get uh, two scopes of quality control um, as a as a preventive and a curative. So um, some people will just choose to buy that because they want to buy the deluxe. You know, if you call it a deluxe, somebody's just always more likely to buy the deluxe versus the basic. Somebody's always just more likely to buy the basic over the deluxe. Um, but but for the actual science and the and the and the end result for the customer, um, we try to sell this on the idea of if if you're buying if you're considering grub control and it's start you're just thinking about it in early August, then your really only option in our opinion is the deluxe to make sure that we can guarantee you if you watered in you get control on any um, uh, uh, already emerged um, uh, white grubs as well. Uh, the other benefit to a product like Arena is that we do get some surface control on uh, things like sad webworm, but uh, primarily chinch bugs, which are also becoming uh, at least more of a problem again here in the upper Midwest. So um, it does have some control on ants, things like that, but we try not to, to, to push that a whole lot because you're never going get to get rid of the colony uh, with that kind of an application. Um, but it will, but it will help. So, um, those are the way we do it. We we use it as a granular for ease of application um, uh, for the technician. We mandate each of our technicians keep uh, a couple bags of each in their truck at all times. So if they can sell somebody and they they meet somebody in the property and that person agrees to put put it down, our our uh, employee has the product right on hand, right when they're there and they can apply it right on the spot versus having to make a second trip. So that's one aspect of it, but then we um, have our guys go around and, uh, and do that with uh, either a fertilizer application uh, or during what we call midsummer inspections in July uh, as well. Um, going off again off of the being the expert and their consultant, email marketing, uh, we basically send out a marketing piece uh, that tries to offer them something. Hey, we provide these services. Um, you should, you know, you should consider this, and you guys can certainly uh, look at how you want to do that. Um, but we also, over time, we send out newsletters to our customers, which is mostly informative. We're not trying to sell anything. Uh, we just try to inform people of what problems may persist or what what things they should consider during summer conditions. It could be simple things like mowing tall, watering, um, high volume, low frequency in the summertime. Could be that there's diseases coming. Um, what to look for for summer diseases, and uh, certainly things like this where mosquitoes are coming um, and, uh, and, uh, and white grubs, uh, the Japanese beetles come back out and, note, and educating people on that process. So the, the, we feel the better uh, customers are educated, the more likely they are to understand the problem, which means the more likely they are to buy. Face-to-face uh, -face with the technician, again, like I mentioned in the last slide, you can apply it right on the spot, and that's why we we tend to use it as a granular. It's so easy for the, the, the uh, staff out in the field to be able to, to apply right in the spot. Um, and we find it, it, it's really no coincidence, the best communicators that we have out in the field, the people that want to engage customers, really do a great job at, at selling and upselling to, to our uh, customer base. Um, we do incentivize our technicians. Um, we give them sales bonuses. Uh, we don't, they're not commissions, we give them bonuses based on um, uh, if they sell different, uh, you know, a variety of different, different uh, services. So uh, there's incentive for them to push it. We want to make sure they want to do that. But we, can, we think we, we do okay with that because we, we, in my opinion, everybody should be doing some kind of a preventive control for grubs because you just don't really know. I mean, I was in Dubuque uh, late, late last season um, golfing in like October and uh, you talk about uh, raccoons coming in, and uh, there was a couple of, of fairways and rough areas that were completely destroyed. Uh, and we and I peeled it back just like a carpet, and there was just a massive amount of grubs in there. So there would have been a prime example if they would have done some kind of preventive approach there. That would have saved them a gigantic amount of maintenance and repair, and unsightly, uh, especially at the golf course. Um, quality notes. 
again, this is really important to us, and we're always striving to get better and, and really push our staff to do so. Uh, but what's important to us is that they have a what, you know, what is the issue, where is the issue. Now, again, with, with white grubs, if you don't see something, uh, s a specific damage, you may have a where for that particular issue. Um, but maybe as well, where has we seen the damage in your neighborhood? Um, and why? Why do I need to get this? So if you're going to try to tell me I need to do something, why? If you just tell me I recommend grub control, um, you are not putting any sense of urgency for somebody to do anything. Uh, I'll always make the analogy when, whenever, whenever I see notes like that or people say, well, I really recommend that you aerate this fall or I really re recommend that you uh, provide grub control. I, I, I like to make the analogy. It's kind of like if anybody's ever gone to the... Uh, to a, uh, get their oil changed at a Jiffy Lube or the, 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 quick, the quick stations or whatever you want to call them to get the quick oil changes. Um, you sit down, and, and, and I've asked this to about a dozen different people over the last couple of months. I said, what is, what is, what is, your, what is the first thing that you think of when you think of these, uh, these uh, oil uh, stations? And every person to a T has said how hard or they, they try to upsell you stuff. Um, but my opinion, they do a very poor job of upselling stuff. They, they just go through a sheet. They, I recommend you do this at this many miles. I recommend this. I recommend this. In human nature, it's, well, you recommend all these things, but I don't really need any of these things. So I think that, that is key is that people understand that if you just recommend stuff to them, people tend to pass because they go, well, yeah, but you rec probably recommend a lot of things. It doesn't mean my law needs it, or that's not a problem for me. Versus if you say, hey, you really need to do something about this issue. Um, sometimes I'll, we'll teach our staff to say, hey, what, we're, what's our job to be your lawn care consultant? So whether you do it, you know, we can help you, give you some pointers of what you should do, or whether we do it, um, something needs to be done. So you really need to do something now. Um, then there's a higher sense of urgency. Um, and again, back to the why, spelling out why they need it. What is going to happen? What is the end result to them? Painting the picture for why they need to do that. If you don't do that, it's very hard for somebody to relate if they can't emotionally understand why it would be a problem. Because the majority of the people we we're putting this product down, or one of these products down for, their lawn aren't their lawns aren't in uh, terrible shape. Like I mentioned, the golf course where it's all ripped up. Uh, so we're trying to have to we have to paint the picture to help them understand what could happen, not what already has happened in some in the few cases that has happened. Um, we also try to mandate that our, that our staff uh, makes a few phone calls uh, back to some lawns that, were at, that had some major issues or if they found a lot of Japanese beetles or, or in signs that could be some major problems, we mandate that they give a couple of calls back every day to those high-sensitive uh, high uh, areas or to those customers that have, could potentially have some big problems. Uh, we do make sales calls to each customer um, uh, if they have not already scheduled grub control to at least notify them of the issue. And then we, we do a really good job at, at training our customer service representatives on inbound calls to be the experts as well and educating them on that and, and making sure they help them find the solutions to their problems. So I would say all of these things are equally important. It's, it's a story that we're telling, and it's a continuous uh, repetitive uh, strategy. That the, It's, it's kind of like anything else in marketing. The more, the more impressions you get to somebody, the better the likelihood they'll, they will buy. Challenges. Uh, Dollars uh, is, is certainly a big part of it. Again, we've chose, we have chosen to be a very uh, high margin. We have chosen to be a high margin service for us, so uh, we, we, we charge a lot of money for it. Uh, the perception of need uh, for a variety of reasons. Again, sometimes people say, well, I don't need it because my lawn is healthy. My lawn looks green. I don't, need, I don't want to pay $200 or $150 or what have you to have something that I don't perceive it to be a need. Uh, again, that would be something like the cost benefit. Well, yeah, but I've never seen a problem out there, so I'll just risk it. I don't want to spend that. I, I doubt I'm going to have an issue. Um, location, again, in their market, maybe they haven't seen Japanese beetles. Um, so that can be a challenge. But again, we should be able to overcome some of that by selling. Um, you know, one of the things that I've, I will tell people is you may not see them always, well, and, and Dave alluded to it earlier about how some of these um, Japanese beetles, for example, because of the... Uh, the, the wet season, they're, some of these, they're immediately going into egg laying stage, so they don't maybe see them out as feeding as often as you would have in the past. But also, if, what if your particular property doesn't have their, you know, their uh, whatever they love to eat, you know, for example, birch trees, rose bushes, uh, raspberry bushes, I believe linden trees, pick, you know, pick your poison, uh, fruit trees, um, they really demolish those. They like to, 
But if you have a whole property that doesn't have that very many of those, you may not see as many of the Japanese beetle adults. So again, help people understand that just because you don't see the beetle doesn't mean that you don't or will not have a problem. Uh, but regardless, that still can be a challenge. Um, we have uh, we have certainly had stable growth. Um, there's no question about that. We've had stable growth. Uh, again, it'll be interesting to see because this year we have a significant, at least anecdotally in our opinion, a significant decline in the in the actual adult Japanese beetle pressure. Uh, we found that at least up here um, that we have people buy typically emotionally. So we tend to tr we tend to target our calling to customers when the Japanese beetles are out and feeding. Uh, because when people see them, they're more likely to go, holy cow, you're right, I, gotta, I, I guess I do have a problem, I need to do something about this. So this year we've seen a significant reduction, um, and part of that might have been because last year's uh, extreme drought, um, uh, where we don't see the Japanese beetles as much this year because there wasn't, as, there wasn't many areas from the way that they, where the eggs uh, survived. So we'll see how that recovers next year. Um, but certainly a lot has to do with the location uh, in Chicago, uh, the markets in Chicago, uh, for uh, specifically for Weedman, uh, there's definitely a higher level of knowledge for the customer base down there about grubs. So uh, they definitely, we close down there at a higher level. Uh, Rockford as well. Uh, but Madison is, is, is certainly good, but again, not as much pressure. Milwaukee, maybe similar to Madison. And then uh, Green Bay, again, just kind of coming into the fold uh, over the last couple of years, and then now just to Minneapolis. So again, certain areas have uh, much higher awareness, which are going to uh, generally uh, induce a higher closing rate. So uh, I believe uh, that is my presentation, correct? That would be it. That's it. Thanks, Andy. We appreciate it. Um, we have a couple minutes for Q&A. So if anybody has questions for Andy, please use your Q&A chat box and send them in. Um, I have just a couple as well. Um, Andy, you and Dave both talked a little bit about callbacks. Can you talk about what do you find is the greatest cause of callbacks when it comes to grub control for you and how you guys handle it? La yeah, uh, lack of watering. <laughs> um, people just don't water it, and then they you get out there and they tell you they did, and they didn't. You know, they, they, I, have, I just have yet to see a circumstance, you know, with Arena or even a Metaclopra where you put it down and it's watered incorrectly, um, where it doesn't just it just doesn't work. You know that just doesn't it just doesn't make much sense, especially when you look at the data that was presented earlier about how how effective those rates are. Well, you know you can be rest assured, rest assured that when uh, Dave's doing those studies, uh, that they're they're doing the appropriate uh, 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 protocols for watering and making sure that so when you can see when it's watered correctly, the efficacy rate is um, for arena um, and uh, midacloprid is through the roof. So when you look at that data. Um, it, typically, the limiting factor is, is, is the customer watering or not watering. And again, a lot of times they tell you they water, and you're like, well, you know, what do you what do you do? You can't, you know, you don't you don't want to get into an argument about uh, whether they watered or not, so you end up just re trying to reapply for them again. And how do you communicate the watering recommendation? Is it a leave behind, or you do your text try to talk to the customer? Yeah, it should be all of the above. Um, when we when we sell somebody right out of the get go, we try to make sure that they, you know, again, I'm sure we're not perfect, but as part of the sale is that when we make the sale, part of the, the we have an actual uh, whole uh, piece of paper that a salesperson has to go through to confirm the sale. And one of the things right on there is to, after they've sold them to tell them, okay, well, just so you're aware, this product does need to be watered in. So, you know, whether you whether this is rains after, that's fine. You get a, you know, a half inch of rain or something like that, um, that's fine. But otherwise, you will need to go out there and water it, you know, for an hour or, or what have you um, in each spot. So the one nice thing, at least, for, and again, I don't think Dave touched on this, but Chris Williamson up here at U University of Wisconsin has said that, I believe um, that with Arena specifically, one of the other advantages that we have, wh wh why we push our deluxe or Arena, um, is that I believe you have about a two-week window. Um, they're finding now that you even have longer uh, time frame where it can sit uh, without being watered in, without degrading too fast. Amidacloprid is far shorter, I believe five to seven days. Um, so that's one other selling aspect that we use with our deluxe is that, well, you can, it can be down for a little longer, so you have more, you have, you have more likelihood that you're going to get natural rainfall, especially for those really big properties where somebody's like, well, I can't water it in, and I understand that. So we try to time it around rain or at least to say, hey, then you should, really should consider the deluxe because um, you have a much wider window. 
Okay, great. And we have a question from the audience about how often are you rolling this service into existing contracts of current customers, I guess, versus selling it initially as part of the program on a, on a new sale? That's a great question. Again, that's probably, well, for us, I can answer that, but again, that might differentiate depending on, on how high of pressure you have. Uh, again, if you have an area that you're extremely high pressure, um, you might lower the price substantially for it and try to just renew people with that. Because um, there are certain, you know, I can think of some colleagues, um, you know, that maybe have 70% plus of their customer base with those. Well, again, it's because they're, um, they're further south, they have more pressure, and they are just auto-renewing, they're renewing them every year with that. Typically for us, anybody that signs up, the way, the way our school of thought's always been, if you sign up um, with us initially um, and you buy a aeration or a grub control, we are going to con auto renew or, or continue that service for you year after year, the whole package. Um, if somebody, for some reason, again, calls in in the wintertime or email or sends in their renewal letter and says, add this service to my program, at that time, we tend to auto-renew them for, the, for that product or for that service. Um, if we call them and they buy because we solicited them to buy that add-on add service, we do not auto-renew them. And part of that is of fear that they won't realize it and they will be upset they didn't want it the next year. Um, but honestly, some part of it is, is that um, we, it's really expensive, so we don't want people to see sticker shock on their, on their renewal letter you know, if they're getting solicited by somebody else, we don't want them to see, you know, all of a sudden, well, these guys are so much cheaper because they just don't, they don't look at it in enough detail to realize that we were including grub control and maybe some competitor wasn't. Right. Okay. Well, that's great. And we are right on time here, so we're going to wrap up. Um, thanks again to both of our speakers. We really appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to Diane to um, give us an end announcement. Thank you for attending the grub control webinar. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the Landscape Management website and will be emailed to you two weeks from today. Please visit the Landscape Management website for future events like this one. Thank you for attending and have a nice afternoon.